And we're all good. We are all good. Take it away, Lauren. Okay. So, um, welcome to our first women's issue talk. This will actually be one of two. Uh, so I'm Lauren. I'm one of the Ottawa coaches. So I'll be kind of leading this talk a bit and it'll be a two part talk. So we've divided it up in kind of into kind of training around your menstrual cycle. And then the second half, uh, Steph, who's a dietitian, is going to come in and talk about fueling as a female. So before we get started, um, I'll kind of get the other coaches who are kind of on the panel to introduce themselves quickly. So uh, why don't we start with Shani and maybe say, you know, full name, where you coach, and uh, maybe your favorite race. Um, my name is Chantel, uh, newly Dijon, <laughs> and I coach in Vancouver. And my favorite race has always been the steeplechase, but I've switched over to mountain running recently. Uh, next up, we'll have Kim. Hi, I'm Kim Dirksen. Uh, I coach in Vancouver. Uh, and my favorite race distance, I guess, would be the marathon. But race in particular would be the Fool's Half on the Sunshine Coast, which is a half marathon from where I'm from. Nice. And we've got Laurel on as well. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Laurel Richardson. I also coach in Vancouver. And I think my favorite road running race comes that comes to mind is the first half, which is in Vancouver and it is in February. Um, and I just really love it. Nice. And uh, Dylan, we all know, <laughs> probably needs no introduction there. Hi, and folks. We, and we also got Steph on the call. She might be muted. I was muted, sorry. No worries. Am I introducing now? Yeah, go over it. Okay, um, so my name's Steph. I'm a registered dietitian, um, currently located in Oakville, Ontario. Um, that's where I see clients in person, um, but I do see clients um, virtually, um, kind of from anywhere. Um, I don't really know that I have a favorite race. I've been injured for like four years and haven't been able to race. So I don't really know um, anything in the fall. Um, that's my favorite time to run. So any kind of race in the fall season, um, I usually enjoy more than any other time of year. Nice. Yeah, I like the fall too. Cross country season is always great. Okay. So with everyone kind of uh, introduced, Dylan, are we able to screens or oh. uh, I think so give it a try see what happens do you have the share screen button at the bottom of I, yours I do it's just telling you it's disabled by the host what oh my goodness what if I make you a host yeah that probably works sit tight folks my technology skills Aha, uh -huh. okay, there we go, perfect. So you guys hopefully can all see my screen and there we go, got the presentation going. So the first bit of this talk, I'm just gonna go a little bit over female physiology, the menstrual cycle, um, kind of slip into doctor mode a bit and explain some of that stuff. Then we'll have a bit of a talk with our coaches in terms of what you can do to actually address some of these things and some training strategies. So hopefully that'll kind of give you guys some actionable kind of strategies. So roadmap of this talk, we'll go over physiologic differences between men and women, the normal mental cycle, disruptions to a normal cycle, uh, strategies for managing symptoms related to your cycle, and then we'll chat with our coaches and then Steph will take over and cover nutrition. Okay. So and Lauren, can I interrupt just for a second? Because you yeah. failed in your introduction if when you said you're going to might slip into doctor mode if people don't know that you you are trained as a medical doctor, correct? Yes. So <laughs> this is coming from a credible background, but does not substitute for the advice of a real physician <laughs> or your own physician. So just keep that in mind, I guess, as well. Um, yeah, onto these, I guess, key physiologic differences. So 
I think it's important to really, when you're thinking of key physiologic differences between men and women, you have to kind of understand that most underpinnings of women's physiology is essentially surrounds ha uh, having babies and preparing the body to have babies, which your body does on a monthly basis. So women, we tend to have more type one fibers, that's the more fatigue resistant fibers. We tend to use lipids over carbohydrates during training. So that might make us not as good at the pure power um, things, but we are pretty good at endurance. So a lot of us, you may train with a male training part you, partner. You might notice you keep up okay on that tempo, on that M pace, but maybe at the end of the workout, if you're having to put down some fast 400s or 200s, they might put a little gap on you. Um, that's pretty normal. It doesn't mean you can't train power. Uh, you can train power, women adapt to it very well. It might just mean it's not as much natural strength for you. Um, we also have lower catecholamines. So catecholamines is kind of like your adrenaline. So that's your fight or flight hormone. So that's during exercise, women release less of them. And physiologically, that's again, basically gonna result in a bunch of changes that'll give you less power output in general. Uh, higher estrogen, obviously, greater body fat percentage. So women need more body fat to be healthy. Uh, elite women, 14% body fat is kind of around the bottom range that they can kind of have and be healthy. An elite male cyclist might get down to 4% and they're okay there. It's just difference in physiology. So we naturally carry a bit more. And again, that's just supporting that childbearing uh, from like an evolutionary perspective. And then the last one here is decreased sweat rate. So some women are impacted by this. Again, this <laughs> changes with training. I sweat way more than I would like to, um, but it's something to consider, especially when you're in the later phase of your cycle. And we'll talk about that a bit more because you might actually sweat a bit less depending on where you are in your cycle. Um, other things, obviously biomechanics, women have wider hips. So it's kind of that arms race between being able to push out a baby's head and survive that event versus kind of efficient locomotion. So narrower hips are better for running, um, but as women, our body is also considering that potential for childbirth, whether or not that's on our agendas. Um, Thermoregulation, again, we're not as good at it as that women tend to get cold more easy. We also don't deal with heat quite as well. Um, but there's a couple strategies you can use to mitigate that. Lower VO2 max. So that's both a function of body size. So smaller heart, smaller lungs. And we also tend to have lower oxygen carrying capacity. So the molecule in your blood, hemoglobin, that carries oxygen, delivers that oxygen to your working muscles. Women tend to have less of it, both because we're menstruating, we're losing blood every single month and we have less EPO. So EPO increases your red blood cell mass. That's why all the cyclists use it and other dopers are using it. So women just tend to be able to carry less oxygen in their blood. So that means if you're keeping up with your male training partner, you're actually working a little harder um, to do that. So you're probably relatively a little more fit, which is kind of cool, but <laughs> um, it's a little bit more work for a woman to output that same pace. And then recovery. So I talked about how women use more fat when they're exercising and men use more carbohydrates. A couple hours after activity that actually switches. So women start to use more carbs and men start to use more of their fat. So in the long run, that helps men burn through their fat more quickly. Women's bodies are trying to conserve that fat um, in case of pregnancy, in case of whatever, your body's always ready. <laughs> so we hold on to that fat a bit more and that makes getting in those carbs after activity more important for women, especially kind of in that like half hour window. So you really want to actually replenish your glycogen stores because that'll help you to recover better. But Steph will cover that more. Um, okay, so that's kind of brief overview, whirlwind overview of a bunch of physiologic facts that makes it make us different in terms of you know men versus women. So the next part is more women specific. It's all about the menstrual cycle. And I'll start with the normal menstrual cycle. So I've got a little graphic here. And 
At the top, we have the ovarian cycle. So that's what's going on in your ovary. We have what's going on in the uterus here. We have your pituitary hormones here. So the pituitary is a little gland in your brain that secretes hormones. And we have our ovarian hormones. So these are the typical female hormones you think about, progesterone, estrogen, the ones we normally talk about. So the ones you guys are probably familiar with. Um, for the purposes of this talk, really would, we're just gonna focus on what's a normal cycle and kind of this high hormone phase and low hormone phase because those are what's more, the most important for your, like relevant to training. Um, there's other things you can focus on for other reasons, but for training, we'll talk low and high hormones and kind of what's that normal cycle. So the normal duration of a cycle is 28 to 35 days. So that's basically four to five weeks. For anyone who's on the pill, it'll typically be 28 days. That's the normal pill cycle for a woman who's menstruating uh, naturally without the pill. It can be anywhere 28 to 35 days. And ideally it should be relatively regular. So that means your cycles are about the same length every month, plus or minus a day or two, but they're relatively regular. The first day of your cycle actually begins with menstruation. So day one of your cycle is the first day of your period, okay? Um, we call this the low hormone phase because you'll notice these ovarian hormones, estrogen, progesterone are pretty low. And basically you have menstruation kind of three to seven days that kind of goes on. Um, and by day 14, you have ovulation. So that low hormone phase, that's where you're most physiological similar to a man um, in terms of your hormones so you might actually experience a bit more energy during that phase training might feel easier and ovulation kind of occurs at day 14. Um, after day 14 basically the egg is released from the follicle so that's this little guy out here and the corpus luteum is formed and basically all that does is make estrogen, progesterone. So those two hormones go up. It's called the high hormone phase. After a couple days, if the egg isn't fertilized, um, those hormone levels fall. And when that happens, you get, or you get menstruation again. So the cycle repeat, repeats itself. And during the high hormone phase, your body's basically just focused on kind of building up that lining of the uterus. So your body's a little bit irrational where it's like, Every month, it's like, is the baby gonna come? And it's getting the uterus ready. Your metabolism actually goes up a little bit. You might have a little bit less energy. And then when that egg isn't fertilized because you're you know, getting on with your life, trying to run a 5K PB, finishing a master's, the whole thing goes out the window again, cycle starts again. So from a physiologic perspective, your body is basically just trying to do its evolutionary job and encourage pregnancy every single month. So that's essentially the female cycle. For training purposes, you have low hormone phase, high hormone phase, and this is when we start to get more of the problematic symptoms, bloating, premenstrual stuff that can disrupt training. So before we get into kind of those symptoms and how to deal with them, I want to touch on, you know, what happens when this cycle goes awry. So Probably, I think most people at this point have heard of fem the female athlete triad. Um, that's the term that's been around longer. And basically that triad is amenorrhea, so missing your period for more than three months in a row is what physicians call amenorrhea. Missing your period once is actually, from a physician standpoint, something we're not too concerned about unless you're obviously you're pregnant or something along those lines. Um, if you are an athlete and you're training hard and you did miss a period, I would maybe like look, I would consider that like a yellow flag where you kind of look into things, assess your diet, assess your stress level, stuff like that. Um, the second part of the triad is decreased bone density. So basically thinning of the bones. So we see, you know, athletes with multiple stress fractures and basically it's setting them up for osteoporosis later down the line and then low energy availability. So energy availability is basically the difference between what you're taking in, your intake, 
and your energy expenditure from exercise. Okay, so those, are, those were like the three original components of the female athlete triad. Um, and then they started to realize that it's not just the bones that are impacted, it's not just the menstrual cycle, this is actually a whole syndrome that's kind of impacting all of these things in your body. And also that, you know, men can have low energy availability as well. So they renamed it relative energy deficiency in sport um, because it's more inclusive of, inclusive of men and kind of started looking into all these other things that can go along with that. So you can see things on the list like GI disturbance, psychological disturbances, so depression, anxiety, irritability, uh, lack of interest in training. Uh, definitely performance can be impacted if you're not you know, meeting those fueling needs. You're gonna have increased injury risk, decreased power output, and it's also actually going to impact, impact your cardiovascular system as well as your bones. So estrogen is really important for protecting your heart. Um, that's why women typically have lower heart attack rates than men, at least before menopause. So basically this syndrome is, has a large impact on your whole body. And that's kind of why they, they renamed it. So it's important to remember that this is a spectrum. So you've got everyone from like the healthy optimum uh, female athlete who's, you know, meeting her requirements, performing at her very best to that kind of middling athlete that I honestly fall into myself sometimes who's like maybe not always meeting her requirements um, but still kind of doing okay to that red flag athlete where you have someone who's maybe more in a disordered eating pattern or missing those periods. You don't have to have disordered eating to miss your periods is the other thing I want to point out here. Um, there's this number that I put in. So basically through research, they found that if the athlete's taking in like less than 30 calories per kilogram of body weight, that's going to uh, increase their risk of having hormonal fluctuations. But that's not true for every athlete. Everyone's body is very different. So you might take in way like less than that and still get a period, or you might take in way more than that and still lose your period. Um, because it's multifactorial, it's not only based on what you're eating. So that's important to keep in mind. Um, the key takeaway from this for you guys is if you are missing the peri your periods, it's definitely something to bring up with your coach. It's definitely something to bring up with your doctor um, and kind of get that addressed. Okay. Lauren, can I interject and ask a question? Sure. Yeah. Um, what if, so you talked a lot about like losing your period as one of the symptoms. And what if for some athletes that they may have many of the other symptoms but still have the, the period, is that still something they should continue to explore and look into? Yeah, so like I think in terms of, like I think some of the other symptoms, like the psychological symptoms, especially like they're irritable, they're depressed, they're not enthusiastic about their training. Um, there could there could be obviously other things going on like life factors or you know a pandemic or whatever it is um, but it's definitely worth looking in to your nutrition maybe even just like logging your food for a couple of days seeing what those calories look like and just being honest with your, yourself like am i getting enough to fuel that training mm -hmm. so i think it can kind of be a good warning sign just checking in with yourself in terms of like how your mental health is doing because those things will start to go usually a bit first before you're starting to get menstrual symptoms depending on the person but yeah hey lauren i'm just going to interrupt on a separate note apparently there's some people that were late to the party that want uh, in to the party and you have to let them in oh i have to oh no i apologize well they were late so <laughs> so that's the issue oh okay so we'll let those guys in Oh, wait, oops. I almost removed someone by mistake. It's okay, crisis supported, she's in now. Um, so we'll kind of move along from that into basically a couple of, I guess, more concrete things you can do to manage some of these symptoms. So I think it's really important to note that everyone's body is different. Um, everyone has different symptoms and everyone has different symptoms month to month. So. I don't know if any of the other coaches have noticed this, but 
most of my athletes are quite consistent, male and female. They're like, if they miss a workout, I'm like, what's up with you? Like, are you okay? Um, and since the pandemic started, I noticed a lot more of my female athletes were missing workouts. Whereas my male athletes just kind of kind of kept plugging along for the most part. And a lot of them also just reported like, they wouldn't normally miss a workout for a period, but they were like, ah, uh, like, uh, feeling bad, like more period related symptoms. So it's important to remember that your stress and the stress your body perceives all kind of affect, has an impact on this and it'll impact the symptoms you feel in a given month. Um, so it's something to kind of just be aware of. It doesn't, there's not enough evidence to say like, you know, we should absolutely do this with our training. We should absolutely not do this with our training. So it's kind of up to the individual athlete to record their cycle and like what they're noticing and what patterns they're finding and maybe bring that up with their coach. So that being said, um, I've broken this up into kind of the low hormone phase, high hormone phase. So low hormone, first day of the period to ovulation. So first 14 days of the cycle. Uh, training might feel a little easier. You might have better pain tolerance, assuming you don't have terrible cramps, uh, in which case that will kind of be negated. Um, but generally you're more similar to your male counterpart during this part of the cycle. So strategies for this, so it could be an opportunity for best performance, although there is a lot of, there have been a lot of studies done on athletes and doing kind of time trials during follicular phase, luteal phase, so that low phase and high phase, um, there's not much, like there was no significant difference. So realistically, for most people, you should be able to actually perform well anytime during your cycle, especially if you're going to use some strategies to mitigate any of the symptoms you're having. So that's kind of the good news. Um, obviously, if you're having really severe symptoms, then that's something that kind of needs to be dealt with and well, can kind of be brought up with your doctor. But for most people, you can manage it with diet and kind of smart strategies. Um, for our high hormone phase, so we have a bit of decreased muscle synthesis. So progesterone is a catabolic hormone. So what that means is it causes more breakdown than buildup. So it might be harder for you to build muscle during that second phase of your cycle. Um, a strategy for dealing that is just making sure you're getting adequate protein. You might bump your protein depending on how you feel. Uh, but just making sure you're meeting those needs during that phase especially. You do have increased metabolism. So your body's using all that energy to thicken the lining of your uterus. And that actually does increase your metabolism. You might have more carb cravings, but you're actually burning fewer carbs. So your body's trying to hold on to that glycogen in case of an emergency. Um, what that means is during workouts, you might want to have a little bit more quick carb on hand because your body might not make it as readily available for you. Bloating, fluid retention. So estrogen and progesterone go up. You basically retain fluid, but annoyingly, it's not in your blood vessels where it would be useful. It's like in your other tissue. So it's just kind of floating around in your body. Um, so basically the best way to deal with that, stay on top of your hydration, eat healthy food, and magnesium supplements can help for some women. Um, in terms of the blood plasma thing, so you can actually, you might actually notice you don't tolerate heat as well in those kind of conditions. So again, that's just really staying on top of your hydration. Um, maybe using some cooling techniques or just choosing to work out during cooler times of the day during certain phases of your cycle. I really like the heat, um, but right before my period, I hate it. I cannot tolerate it. So it's just knowing things like that about your body and just kind of knowing that about yourself. Um, decreased re reaction time, not a huge deal for endurance athletes, soccer players, ho hockey players, a bit more of an issue. Um, maybe don't try downhill trail running for the first time right before your period. Might be a bad idea, but otherwise it should be fine. And then you have your pre-menstrual symptoms. So GI disturbance, constipation, diarrhea, mood issues, headache, cramps, etc. cetera. Um, most of those pre-menstrual symptoms can be made better uh, with good nutrition, good healthy kind of food. In terms of the mood strategies, I think that's something you kind of have to address with your own mental, mental gain. 
So it can be tougher mentally to get through workouts and just have a strategy how you're going to get through that if you're feeling that way. Um, but yeah, so most of these things, it's all just kind of preparation and general healthy lifestyle things. And Steph will touch on some of the more specific nutrition things during her talk. So I guess in terms of the coaches, so we'll kind of move on to that panel a bit. I was kind of hoping that um, some of you guys, maybe Chantal and Kim could talk a bit about at first like training as a female um, and what their experience was like as kind of a competitive athlete, maybe growing, growing up and through university until now. Um, I can talk to that. Yeah. I actually, in high school, in the first little bit of university, I struggled more with severe symptoms of PMS. So bad cramping to the point of like wanting to throw up. So I just had so much anxiety around, okay, when is my period going to come? And what if it's on a big race? Like what if it's provincials or nationals or something serious and what was I going to do? And then as I figured out nutrition and I figured out what worked for my body, it actually got so much better. So the second half of university into racing post-collegiately and to this day, I found diet was like my biggest, my biggest game changer, as well as, as you'd mentioned, stress. So what stressors are going on in my life? If, if it was a high stress time, then definitely uh, symptoms would be a lot worse. And same thing with how much sugar am I taking in, how much alcohol um, how much healthy, how many healthy fats in, do I have in my diet on a regular basis? Um, so yeah, that was my experience, but it, it was, it was really uncomfortable to have the unknown of when's it going to come? What if it's on a big race day and, and how would I respond from a performance standpoint and from like a mental, mental attitude towards the, the race? Yeah, I think that causes like more anxiety which makes things kind of worse um i read somewhere that paula radcliffe actually set her marathon record on like the first day of her period which i find very amazing but yeah seriously <laughs> so you, like you could pull out a stellar performance so yeah it's nice to know i guess those kind of things it, yeah it's just why add that extra physical pain on top of physical pain <laughs> You just don't even notice it anymore. That's the benefit. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Everything else hurts so much. It's just like lost in the noise. <laughs> yeah, totally. Oh my gosh. Um, and Kim, did you have anything to add or? Yeah, I'd say I'm like the polar opposite of Shani. Um, I lost, like I got my period at a regular age of menstruation of like 13 or something. Uh, and I actually lost my period when I was 17. Um, and coincidentally, 11 years later, got it back today um, after a lot of work for it. So I never actually went through, I didn't have the same kind of physiological symptoms as Shani's talking about. I didn't have that apprehension, like it, I lost it through secondary amenorrhea uh, and then just kind of like basked in the fact that I didn't have a period and didn't have to worry about tampons and having cramps or anything like that, but um, I naively didn't realize the repercussions it was having on the rest of my health and what that whole picture looked like. Yeah, I think we like, we were kind of talking about uh, this a bit in our coaches chat last night. And um, you actually went to like a couple doctors too, didn't you? And yeah, it was like, so I naively, again, like just kind of didn't really think anything of it. And my mom was like, ah, oh, you should go to a gynecologist. Um, and I wanted to walk in with just like a sign being like, I'm not a teen mom. Because um, I was super uncomfortable talking about anything to do with periods and women's health, basically. Um, and so I went and the doctor kind of looked at me and was just like, oh, your body's just not ready to have a baby. And I was like, hey, sweet, my brain's not either. So like, this is a closed book. We're just going to move on from this. And it wasn't until like probably five years later that I was... I uh, went to an Athletics Canada camp and was told like, hey, you might have relative energy deficiency. You should look into this. So I worked with another doctor. And again, same thing, went to a gynecologist, didn't have the best bedside manner and like laughed at my results. 
um, and again said like your body's not ready to have a baby went to an epidemia or a, a endocrinologist to look at hormones same thing your body's not ready to have a baby and like just kind of was scoffed off basically and then was told like hey go on birth control it's going to give you hormones and you should be okay and it wasn't until kind of last year I went and started delving more into it went and got a proper bone density scan I found my bones were on the lower end of normal so running was kind of a blessing and a curse if I had been a swimmer or a cyclist I could have had like early onset osteoporosis or like osteopenia mm -hmm. um so running was a benefit because of the impact um but yeah so I was kind of scoffed off by doctors so it meant that I never really wanted to engage with them um I I didn't feel like there was any benefit and it just I ended up just not kind of dealing with it for a number of years yeah which is like which is really too bad um and I think a big part of that is just education and awareness on the part of physicians um but i think it's really important to bring up like within our community and within our community of runners because you at least because then it people at least people know for themselves that if they are having this issue to keep to keep going until they find that doctor that's going to do the testing for them and going to like take it seriously um, when i think one really important thing that you mentioned as well is looking at the whole picture like people are looking at like hey you don't have a period they weren't looking at what's your stress level like? What's your nutritional intake? Like what other factors in your life? How's your mood? Like I was hella irritable and I just thought it was just me had like having a bad sleep or something. Um, and so all those things are starting to come to head of like, oh, these are all signs and symptoms that something was going on that I had reds, but nobody really like enlightened me with that. And I wasn't educated enough in that area to kind of like have a light bulb go off for myself. Um, so it is something that's really great to talk about with athletes. Like I know that as coaches, we've talked about when a new athlete comes in, like asking the question of like, what is your menstrual cycle? Like, is it frequent? Is it, have you lost one? Like, why was that happening? What's the stress at work? Like all those components are so important to talk about. Yeah, exactly. And like keeping, like keeping that conversation open and just making sure people are comfortable coming to you as a coach. Like if they're having problems, like if they lose their cycle or even if they're just like, having a terrible workout because their hormones are messing with them like that just making sure that people are comfortable opening up that conversation uh with all of us kind of thing um so i kind of wanted to touch on next i was hoping kind of dylan and laurel could contribute a, a bit more in terms of working with athletes like around their menstrual cycle do you have athletes that you work with particularly around their menstrual cycle is it something that's like more on the fringe or do you have like some really focused on it um what's your experience with that i don't know if you want to start laurel <laughs> sure i'll start um so i'd say the i mean the answer is probably all those things and it depends i'd say in my experience of coaching um really long endurance athletes such as those training for an ironman it's certainly um, a, it has been a bigger conversation, not that it's more important there, but it certainly is quite a big factor if you're doing a, a really long, like say you're doing an Ironman in a warm climate in the higher um, hormone phase that we just really think about like additional nutrition and hydration and that it, it may feel a lot hotter than it is. Um, I do, I have worked with athletes in the past who have sort of approached the subject of like, well, you know, they've heard in research that they could, um, and maybe Lauren, you can address this as well of why it's probably not a good idea, but to um, control their um, cycle through birth control of like, I think I'm going to have my period during a race. So I'm not going to take that off week and I'm just going to blaze over it and do it later. Like that kind of thing, which I've always discouraged, but know that many females especially in the past have done. Um, and so I think like, of course it's really important and it hasn't been a, like the, the conversation with every athlete, but I certainly um, invite it and, you know, focus on it where we can, especially with this, actually the slide that you have up now that, you know, there is an opportunity to run your very best no matter what day it is. And just to be able to start to understand your own body um, so that we can create the conditions for that to happen. Yeah, I think that's 
I think that's a good point. I kind of like, I definitely want to emphasize with the presentation that it's not um, just because you have symptoms, it doesn't necessarily mean it's something that has to hold you back. It's something that can be managed. Yeah. And like kind of talked about with your coaches, there's kind of strategies to address those things. Um, in terms of like manipulating your cycle with the pill, uh, I guess it depends what they're doing. Like if they're already on the pill and they just want to take the pill continuously, um, that's actually okay. You're not getting a normal uh, period. You're not getting like a natural period per se when you have your pill. It's more just like a withdrawal bleed. So the estrogen and progesterone levels that are a certain level, you take them away, you get a bleed because of that. Um, obviously they can get spotting unexpected stuff if their body's not used to that. So I wouldn't do it right before a race just because it's a little bit unpredictable. Um, I've heard of people trying to manipulate their periods way out far from races, um, more like elite athletes, but they used to do it with like, I think progesterone pills and didn't have good results. Mm -hmm. So I'm not really up to date on that research, but yeah, I wouldn't recommend toying with it right before a race, that's for sure. Yeah, I'm definitely not up to date, um, but I've sort of stuck to that. If you, want to, if you want to talk about it with someone, I'm probably not the best, but yeah, I've definitely heard people explore it. Yeah, thanks. And what about from your end, Dylan? Do you find like, do you think people are more, do you think women are more hesitant talking to you or do you think it's like, you have some athletes who are like all over it, some athletes, not so much? Yeah, I would say it's a bit of a mixed bag. And, you know, certainly from the perspective uh, of being a male, uh, maybe I'm not as comfortable in some instances talking about it. Um, but I think it's, you know, and I've had this conversation with other male coaches too, that they're like, ah, I don't need, like, sometimes I don't even want to bring up the subject with, with some athletes and stuff. Uh, but I think it's kind of our responsibility as coaches to certainly be available to our, our female athletes for that. And, um, you know, I always say to the other coaches that it, it's either, sure there's like these taboos that we kind of feed into maybe sometimes around uh, a woman's menstrual cycle and their period, but it, it's just a sign that they're a healthy female body doing, and it, it's, you know, it's actually quite amazing. This, the, the cycle that, that they're going through and, uh, that the male body couldn't, does not do, do that, right? So, um, yeah, I think uh, at this point, uh, you know, I would say that the majority of the females that I work with are open to talking with me about it. And really for me, I'm kind of in the infancy of, of learning the strategies to, to be able to employ uh, to, to help my athletes around it, um, tracking, when they're having their their period is is really like the first step for me and and knowing when that's going to happen and uh you know from there i've used the book uh roar to kind of help me along and uh and be able to you know maybe make some suggestions for i always encourage all of my female athletes to uh, read that book but maybe myself can pull some suggestions for for athletes from there yeah, I think that's like, it's a great resource for sure. And after this talk, you'll just get so many more messages about it. So <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> All right. So I think we should probably uh, hand things over to Steph now for her half of the talk. Um, so I think we might have to make her host, I guess, in that case. Um, so she can share her screen. That would be lovely. Okay. Da, 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 da. Uh, Dylan, are you able to do that or should I be doing it now? Um, so if you, I can see if I can still do it. I don't think I can. Um, if you go to the participant panel. Oh, okay. You should be, so, you click on our name. There should be a yeah. more. There you go. Okay. I've handed over the hosting to Steph. And hopefully, there we go. Okay.
screen sharing failed to start. Let me try again. It's not. Where'd it go? Is it shared? Can everybody see yep. it? Okay. Yeah, we can see you now. Perfect. All right. So I'm going to take over talking about the fueling through the menstrual cycle. Um, so when Lauren gave an overview of it, she kind of talked about two phases. Um, when it comes to nutrition, I kind of break it down further into four um, phases. Um, just because you can see with the change in hormones, it kind of changes four times throughout the uh, menstrual cycle. Um, so we kind of have, you know, menstruation, the first like one to seven days, um, phase two up until ovulation, um, phase three is kind of after ovulation, and then phase four would be kind of the last seven days of a stereotypical or typical 28-day um, um, cycle. Um, so phase one then starting with nutrition around menstruation. Um, so as Lauren said, you know, your physiology is most similar um, to that of a man's during your period. Um, and, you know, again, I just want to reiterate that it doesn't mean that you can't have a successful performance any other time of the uh, menstrual cycle. Um, research studies show that your VO2 max, um, so the maximum amount of oxygen that you can use during intense exercise, um, as well as your lactate threshold, so the maximum effort um, or intensity that you can maintain um, for an extended period of time without kind of building up that lactate, um, is the same regardless of what phase of the menstrual cycle that you're in. Um, so you can still perform your best even if you have PMS. Um, so then just some uh, nutrition tips then, um, and we'll dive each, into each of them um, individually. Um, so kicking it off um, with anti-inflammatory foods. Um, and we use these to help um, manage symptoms that are associated um, with menses. Um, so omega-3s are an essential fatty acid. Um, that means that our bodies can't produce them on its own. So we have to get it from food. Um, it helps to reduce inflammation in the diet um, by acting as a precursor for hormones that play a role in regulating inflammation. Um, apart from playing a role in uh, managing inflammation, omega-3 fats are also important for our bone and joint health for brain function, um, and for our cardiovascular health um, as well. Um, so really, we're looking to take in about one to two grams of omega-3 um, fats per day to help manage uh, some of those PMS symptoms like mood disturbances, menstrual cramps, um, and breast tenderness as well. Um, so we've got kind of three main sources of omega-3s. We've got what we call ALA, um, which are found primarily in plant oils and nuts like walnuts. Um, and then we have our EPA and DHA, uh, which is found in fatty fish um, and fish oils like salmon. Um, so a three ounce uh, serving of salmon, so three ounces about the size of a deck of cards, actually has 1.6 grams of omega-3 fats, um, a similar amount of sardines, has about 1.2 grams of omega-3 fats. Um, and since both of those are coming from marine sources, there are EPA and DHA. Um, and then for our, you know, maybe plant-based athletes, an ounce of walnuts um, has 2.57 grams of that ALA. Um, and a tablespoon of flax has about 2.3. Um, now the body has to convert that ALA into the more active EPA and DHA forms, and that conversion rate um, is slightly lower. Um, and then other inflammatory foods um, that we're looking at include berries, um, our dark leafy green vegetables, um, garlic, you know, one to two cloves of garlic a day, um, ginger, like half a teaspoon of ginger powder, um, and then curcumin. Um, as well to help manage that uh, inflammation. Um, and this is just a recipe for a little kind of anti-inflammatory shot. It's not really a shot. It's almost like half a cup. Um, so there's some orange juice, some garlic, ginger, um, and curcumin. So 
just kind of packing in um, a lot of those anti-inflammatory compounds um, into a little uh, drink of juice. So sometimes I actually use this with athletes, um, you know, to help support their immune system if they're going to be traveling um, for a race, um, helping to just kind of manage that like stress and inflammation that kind of comes with that too. Um, but it can be useful um, for sure to help manage uh, some symptoms associated with menses. Um, and then we've got our antioxidant foods. Um, so a diet um, that includes a lot of these antioxidant foods can help to reduce menstrual symptoms. Um, they also help to accelerate recovery after a hard session and they support your immune system. Um, so fruits and vegetables um, are great sources of antioxidants. So it's better to load up on these natural sources um, rather than turn to supplements. Um, so again, our, our berries and our dark leafy green vegetables, as well as being um, anti-inflammatory, um, also serve as antioxidants. Um, tart cherry juice and green tea are other good options. So, you know, you could kickstart your morning with some fresh berries to accompany your oatmeal. Um, you know, at a main meal, try to include you know, maybe two to three different vegetables and ensure that at least one of them, um, you know, is a dark leafy green like spinach, kale, um, broccoli, or lettuce, you know, and maybe, you know, you have green tea in the afternoon instead of a second cup um, of coffee. Um, and then during this phase, it's <clears throat> important to pay attention um, to our iron intake because we're um, losing iron um, through the blood. Um, so iron is important um, because it helps to produce red blood cells and transports oxygen um, throughout the body. Uh, depending on the length um, and flow of your cycle, the amount of blood lost um, during menstruation can put somebody at risk um, for uh, low iron levels, um, which contributes to low energy um, and fatigue. Um, and iron deficiency is actually one of the most common uh, nutrient deficiencies um, among women of childbearing age. Um, so the best um, sources of iron for the body, um, which are more readily absorbed, um, come from animal-based products. So it's known as heme iron. Um, so beef, lamb, liver, duck, um, chicken, and mussels. Um, our plant-based sources are non-heme iron. Um, they're not as well absorbed by the body. Um, so we find them in chickpeas, lentils, kidney beans, green leafy vegetables, nuts, and seeds. Um, but we can consume vitamin C at the same time to help increase the absorption of this non-heme iron. Um, so vitamin C we find in peppers, um, citrus fruit, and dark leafy green vegetables. Um, so we've got some foods that help to increase the absorption of iron, but we also have foods that inhibit um, iron absorption. Um, so those are foods rich in calcium um, and polyphenol. So calcium in like milk and yogurt, um, and then tea, coffee, cocoa, and red wine. Um, so if you're having, you know, an iron rich meal, or if you're taking, you know, an iron supplement, um, be sure that you kind of take it away from some of these um, food sources. Um, and in this phase, um, you know, you might notice a decrease in your appetite, um, but that doesn't mean that you should completely disregard your fueling. Um, it's still important that you meet your daily fueling requirements to support your training. Um, so generally, you're looking to have, you know, a meal or a snack every three to four hours. Um, when we start going for longer periods of time without food, um, we kind of disrupt um, the pulsatility of our luteinizing hormone, um, which peaks at ovulation, um, which can result um, in some menstrual disturbances. Um, so sometimes we see reds in athletes um, because they're just leaving big gaps um, between their meals. You know, they might be fuel eating enough calories kind of overall, 
but they're just going such long periods of time between those meals um, and it's disrupting the pulsatility of that luteinizing hormone um, and that's responsible um, for the menstrual disturbances. All right, so phase two. So this is once, you know, kind of menstruation is done all the way up to ovulation. Um, so a few things to focus on. Um, so again, um, you might feel better, you know, in this kind of first phase of the menstrual cycle, um, your strength level levels might be higher. Um, so you might feel that you can, you know, train longer or train more intensely. Um, if this is the case, it's just important to make sure that you're consuming protein and carbohydrates as soon as you can after training. Um, I mean, this is always important. And I mean, a lot of the things that I'm talking about, you know, eating anti-inflammatory foods like antioxidants, like those are good regardless of the phase of your menstrual cycle um, that you're in. But in this particular phase, you know, it's, um, it can be even more beneficial. Um, so for most women then, um, this means consuming about 15 to 25 grams of protein, um, which is about a serving of protein slightly bigger than a deck of cards, and then about 45 to 75 grams of carbohydrates, um, or about one to two um, fists worth of a carbohydrate food. So rice, oats, um, potatoes, quinoa, stuff like that. Um, and then we've got um, soft tissue recovery. So a lot of research um, around this has really been done in soccer players, um, noticing an increased risk of ACL tears in this phase of the menstrual cycle. Um, so with the increase in estrogen prior to ovulation, um, we get a decreased synthesis of collagen. Um, and it's also associated with increased joint laxity and altered neuromuscular control. Um, so this means that some joints um, might be less uh, stable and some of the muscles surrounding them might activate um, a little bit differently. Um, so this is, again, why we see more ACL tears um, in soccer, because they tend to do a lot of like changing directions. Um, you know, this also might be something to consider if you're doing like trail running or running in really, you know, kind of ragged trails, just being aware um, of this. Um, so this is a good time to make sure that you're getting a good warm up in prior to a hard workout um, so that you can really prime your nervous system. Um, so to help with recovery from these, um, you know, soft tissues, um, collagen is important. It helps. Um, it provides a source of amino acids that can help rebuild muscles and other tissue. Um, it also supports our bone structure um, and stimulates osteoblast activity. So these are the cells that cause bone formation. And then it also helps to decrease the activity of our osteoclasts, which are the cells that break down existing bone. Um, and then I do just kind of want to clarify because, um, you know, I got a lot of people thinking that like collagen powder or collagen protein powder is the same as like regular protein powder. Um, they're not equivalent. Um, collagen is missing one of the nine essential amino acids and it's low in the essential amino acid leucine, um, which we'll talk about in a bit, but it's um, really the muscle building trigger. Um, and then each serving of collagen is somewhere between like 10 to 13 grams of protein, um, whereas a scoop of like whey protein um, is about 20 to um, 25. Um, so that 10 to 13 grams isn't quite enough to kind of repair um, and recover well. Um, so I just kind of want to make that distinction um, between the two. Um, that's not to say that like collagen isn't good, you know, like if you want to use a collagen powder, like in a smoothie or something around this time, you might just have to make sure that you're including another source um, of protein. So mixing, you know, some Greek yogurt um, into the smoothie as well, and not just relying on the collagen powder alone as your sole protein source for that smoothie. Um, in terms of where we can get it from food, um, bone broth is made of bones and connective tissue, um, so it's a good source of collagen. Um, we also get it in uh, chicken, uh, fish, and shellfish, um, especially if we kind of get some bones in like the cans of fish. 
Um, and although eggs don't contain um, connective tissues like a lot of the other animal products, um, egg whites do have a large amount of proline, which is an amino acid that's necessary for collagen production. Um, garlic is high in sulfur, um, which is a trace mineral that can help to synthesize and prevent the breakdown of collagen. Um, beans um, offer a source of protein and they contain the right kind of balance of amino acids that are necessary um, to make collagen. Um, a lot of them are also rich in copper, um, which is a mineral that's necessary for collagen production. Um, and then vitamin C um, is, plays a big role in the production of what we call pro-collagen. So it's what comes before collagen. Um, so getting enough vitamin C um, with some of these collagen rich or collagen kind of forming foods is important. Um, and so again, it's the red peppers, uh, citrus fruit, um, dark leafy greens like broccoli, Brussels sprouts, and then we get them in strawberries and kiwis as well. Um, and then just like in phase one, we still want to make sure that you're fueling regularly. You know, you still might notice a bit of a decrease in your appetite. And again, that doesn't mean that your fueling needs just get thrown out of the window. Um, so again, every kind of three to four hours, um, we're looking to be taking in a source of fuel. All right. Um, and then in phase three, so this is after ovulation. So a couple things to consider here. Um, so the rise in estrogen in phase three makes it harder for you to access your carbohydrate fuel stores, as Lauren said at the beginning of the presentation. Um, you know, it's likely to help you save um, those glycogen stores in case of pregnancy. Um, your ability to use fat as a fuel source um, is easier, which is great for lower intensity, you know, kind of endurance runs. Um, but for higher intensity activity, you know, like a speed workout, um, you know, it's a good idea to try and get some carbohydrate on board. Um, so, you know, maybe 15 to 20 minutes beforehand, taking in a quick um, source of uh, easily digestible carbohydrate. Um, and then in this phase, we're looking for a slightly higher carbohydrate intake per hour. So about 45 to like 60 grams of carbs um, per hour um, in this phase. Um, in the first kind of half, we can get away with a little less, about like 30 to, to kind of 45. Um, and then the difficulty of accessing these carbohydrate stores, you know, explains why you might crave more foods that are sweet um, or salty, you know, like chocolate or uh, chips, for example. Um, and then we want to also prioritize uh, protein um, in this phase. Um, so with the estrogen levels rising, it turns down our anabolic or our growing capacity of the muscles. And then progesterone, which is also rising in that phase, um, turns up the catabolism or the breakdown of muscle tissues. Um, so it makes it a lot uh, more difficult. Um, the result, you know, is a higher rate of muscle breakdown after hard efforts. Um, so we want to make sure that we're taking in um, a good source, a good amount of protein um, you know, within 30 minutes of finishing a higher intensity effort. Um, and here is where we're focusing on that amino acid uh, leucine. You know, two and a half to three grams of leucine um, has found to be that kind of metabolic trigger, that switch um, to stimulate muscle building. Um, so one 30 gram uh, scoop of whey protein has about three and a half grams of leucine. So it's particularly good um, at this time. Um, one can of tuna also has 3.8 grams of leucine. Um, four ounces, so about a cup of uh, chopped chicken um, has about 3.3 grams. Um, four large eggs has two grams. And then for our plant-based athletes, half a block of tofu has 2.6 grams of leucine. And a cup of cooked lentils has 1.2. And then a quarter cup of almonds has half a gram of leucine. 
Um, now a note on chocolate milk um, is a runner's, actually most athletes kind of favorite um, recovery beverage. Um, and it's a great way to get in, you know, some protein and some carbs to help replenish um, your glycogen. Um, but to up the protein just a little bit, um, and in particular, um, leucine, you know, adding like a small full of hand, a small handful of um, almonds um, would just kind of help to bump up, you know, the leucine and the overall protein um, just a little bit. Um, there's also some research to suggest um, that taking about five to seven grams of branch chain amino acids or BCAAs um, prior to a workout can help to fend off um, central nervous system fatigue, um, which might be a little bit higher um, in this stage because of the increase in progesterone um, and estrogen. Um, you know, I don't feel 100% comfortable saying that everybody should take BCAAs um, in this phase. Um, you know, I personally feel no effect taking BCAAs um, in this phase. Um, so I think, you know, there's definitely individual differences. Um, but, you know, if you're someone who tends to feel lethargic and a little more fatigued um, at this time of the menstrual cycle, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with trying out, um, you know, a BCAA supplement um, to see if that, um, that helps to fend off any of that, uh, you know, those feelings of fatigue. Um, all right. And then we want to try again and just maintain our energy levels. Um, so because it's harder for us to access our carbohydrate fuel stores, you know, your blood sugar levels may be a little bit more unstable, which again results in some of the cravings and the moodiness. Um, so we want to try and prevent any dips in energy. Um, so including snacks that have a source of complex carbohydrates um, and some protein. Um, Again, you should be, the snacks should kind of have this, you know, regardless of the menstrual cycle phase, but it's, you know, uh, even more important um, in this kind of third phase of the menstrual cycle. Um, and then hydration um, is really big in this kind of third phase. Um, so once you, after ovulation, um, your core temperature increases about um, half a degree. So you might just feel hotter to begin with. Um, estrogen increases the expression of a hormone called vasopressin, um, which is responsible for retaining water and constricting our blood vessels. Um, so this causes your blood pressure to increase, um, which signals your plasma uh, volume to drop by as much as uh, 8%. Um, so plasma volume is just the volume of fluid in the body. So it can drop by as much as 8% in this phase. Um, at the same time, uh, progesterone um, competes uh, for the same receptor um, as another hormone um, that regulates fluid. And this hormone is called aldosterone. Um, and so we get a lower release of aldosterone, which kind of sets off Another chain of events um, that leads to a reduction in blood volume and also um, blood pressure. So again, you might get more bloating in the second half of your menstrual cycle um, and exercise might feel a little bit harder because of the decrease in your plasma volume. Um, when it's low, you know, our blood is a little bit thicker and kind of hard to circulate um, throughout the body. Um, on top of that, the lower blood volume makes it harder for the body to sweat and to cool itself. Um, so during long runs, like three plus hours, you know, you might be at an increased risk of heat stress um, or hyponatremia. So that's low um, blood sodium levels um, because progesterone actually makes you lose more sodium. Um, so you might notice that your sweat is a little bit more salty too in this phase of your menstrual cycle. So to compensate for that shift in your core temperature um, and body fluid, it's important that you start drinking before your workout, um, especially if you're exercising in the heat. Um, so, you know, general guidelines of about two to three cups in the two to three hours before exercise, 
then an additional cup about 20 to 30 minutes before you're going to run. Um, you should, however, add a little bit of salt um, to that fluid. Um, now, it doesn't have to be much. I'm talking like 1 16th of a, a teaspoon of salt for every like two and a half cups of water. But that little bit of salt is going to help the body pull the fluid into the cells. Um, so there's a few kind of supplements. Um, the right stuff is popular amongst some endurance athletes. They use it in Major League Baseball um, and in the NHL. Um, and it's got a high concentration of sodium along with a few other electrolytes. Um, my jaw literally dropped when I saw how much sodium was in this. Um, so you could consider taking, you know, half a package and blend it with three cups of water and just kind of sip on it um, before a run. Uh, Noon also makes a pre-sweat drink that contains sodium. Um, it does also have a little bit of BCAAs in it, like 1.5 grams, so not quite the five to seven um, that we would need to maybe um, attenuate any of that fatigue or lethargy. Um, and then during the run too, um, you want to make sure that you're hydrating. Um, again, your sweat rate is kind of individualized. So really you should have an individualized um, kind of hydration plan based on your own sweat rate. Um, but generally most people can tolerate about 400 to, 400 to 800 milliliters of fluid um, per hour. Um, but we want to make sure that it's not just water, that we're getting some electrolytes in there um, as well. So something like a noon tab, you know, just that sodium is going to help to pull the, um, the fluid into the cells. And that brings us to the last phase. Um, so phase four. So this is kind of the week leading up um, to your period. Um, so again, fuel your training. This happens in every single um, phase. Um, so with the higher levels of estrogen, um, again, harder to access the carbohydrate stores. We want to avoid any of the dips in energy. Um, so again, we're looking at, you know, maybe a little bit of extra carb before a training session um, and then about, you know, 45 to 60 grams of carbs um, per hour for any kind of long um, training session. Um, and then to manage our symptoms, you know, we want to eat a variety of anti-inflammatory and antioxidant rich foods. So we went over that um, in phase one. Um, so because our estrogen and progesterone start to drop, as we approach phase one again and start uh, menstruation, um, this can cause some localized um, inflammation and cause some of those like premenstrual um, symptoms. So that's why we want to, you know, focus on those anti-inflammatory and antioxidant uh, rich foods here. Um, and then there is, you know, a little bit of a PMS pre-plan. Um, you can start taking uh, these supplements about five to seven days before your period is due, um, and it can help to manage um, some of the symptoms. And I can say, like, this has been like a game changer for me. Um, I just happened upon this kind of like concoction of supplements, um, you know, just like randomly. I was taking each supplement for like a different reason. Um, and then I was traveling in the UK for like a conference and, you know, I knew my like period was coming, but I wasn't getting any like symptoms. And all of a sudden, you know, I went to the washroom at like a market and like I got my period. I was like, wow, I didn't even have any like warning signs. Like what the heck? Um, and then, you know, after the conference, you know, I kind of went and like looked into it and it was like, oh, you know, it was this combination of supplements um, that I was taking minus the baby aspirin. Um, I was not taking the baby aspirin, but I didn't get any symptoms um, with that. Um, so uh, magnesium um, we take because it helps to relax the smooth muscles of the uterus, um, which reduces um, the release of prostaglandins that cause some period pain. Um, zinc levels tend to fluctuate throughout the menstrual cycle, um, and they tend to be lower in this um, phase. Um, which might contribute to PMS. Um, again, the omega-3s are those anti-inflammatories. 
Um, and then the baby aspirin suppresses the production of prostaglandins irreversibly. So it has to be baby aspirin and it can't be ibuprofen or another NSAID um, because their effect on prostaglandins are reversible. Um, and then we want to target, um, you know, certain nutrients. Um, so we've got vitamin D supports our immune function um, and can help reduce uh, some PMS symptoms. Um, calcium plays a role in the production of serotonin and tryptophan, which regulate our mood and kind of overall well-being. Uh, magnesium helps to reduce um, PMS-related mood and pain-related symptoms and can also help with uh, water retention. Again, the omega-3 fats are those anti-inflammatories, um, help to reduce mood, dis mood disturbances, menstrual cramps, and breast pain. And then our B vitamins, um, again, mood, physical pain, and water retention as well. Um, so we'll just go, few, go through a few um, food sources. Um, so vitamin D isn't abundant in our food system, um, but there are some foods that naturally um, contain it. Um, so salmon, um, sardines, you know, it's fortified um, in milk. Um, some yogurts um, have it um, as well. Um, now that it's sunny outside, um, you know, we can get vitamin D from the sun, but generally from the, from the fall um, to kind of the spring, um, we can't get adequate vitamin D um, from the sun, so it generally is a good idea to supplement uh, with vitamin D during those months um, up here in Canada. Um, calcium, again, milk, cheese, and other dairy foods, uh, green leafy vegetables, we find it in broccoli, cabbage, okra, um, soybeans, tofu, soy drinks that have added uh, calcium to it, um, nuts, any kind of grain that has a fortified flour will have calcium in it as well. Um, and then fish where you eat the bones as well are gonna be good sources of calcium. Magnesium, we get in our dark leafy greens. Those seem to be popping up a lot. Uh, baby spinach, kale, collard greens, um, nuts and seeds, so almonds, sunflower seeds, Brazil nuts, cashews, pine nuts, flax seeds. Um, we find it in wheat germ, uh, a variety of fish, soybeans, bananas, avocados, and low-fat yogurt. We've already been over some food sources of omega-3s, um, you know, generally fatty fish, um, flax seeds, walnuts, um, plant oils like flaxseed oil and soybean oil. Um, and then we can also get certain foods that are fortified with omega-3s. So we can get omega-3 eggs. Um, I've seen omega-3 added to juices um, and some yogurts as well are fortified with omega-3. B vitamins we get in our whole grains, brown rice, barley, uh, millet, oats, um, meat, eggs and dairy products. We find B vitamins in legumes, nuts and seeds, those dark leafy green vegetables again, um, and citrus fruits. Um, so as I said, we should kind of always be striving to reduce our processed foods, but especially in this phase of the menstrual cycle, um, processed foods are higher in fat, sugar, um, and kind of added sugar as well. Um, so they're pro-inflammatory, so they promote inflammation in the body. Um, since we already have the drop in estrogen and progesterone, um, as we head toward menstruation, um, increasing inflammation in the body. You know, we don't just want to be throwing more fuel on the fire um, by eating a lot of these processed foods. Um, so, you know, I've kind of experienced this myself. Um, you know, the, that like little concoction of supplements that I said, you know, can help to manage symptoms. You know, it's not the be all to end all. Um, before one of my... Um, periods. It was some sort of holiday and there was like cake around. And I think I had, you know, like a slice of cake for probably like four days in a row because there was leftovers and stuff like that. And then I got my period shortly after and I experienced the worst 
symptoms like I've ever experienced in terms of like cramping this and that, like usually um, exercise kind of helps alleviate um, any pain that I'm experiencing. But like I had to cut my workout short at the gym. Um, you know, I just like wasn't having it that day. Um, and I attribute it, you know, in part um, to an increase, um, you know, in the, in the added sugars in my diet, because generally I don't eat um, a lot of added sugars. Um, so it's amazing the effect um, that it can have. Um, and then in this um, phase, a lot of women might experience um, disrupted sleep. Um, so this could be for a number of reasons, um, but to promote a better night's sleep, um, you know, we really want to try and create a consistent routine. So, you know, maybe it's taking a shower, then it's brushing your teeth, then reading a book for 20 minutes. You know, your body just kind of learns that this sequence of events is, you know, associated with bed, you know, and it just starts to wind down once you start doing that routine. Um, you want your room to be dark and cool. So about 15 to 19 degrees Celsius is like an optimal kind of sleeping temperature. Um, blue light interferes with the body's sleep-wake cycle, so keeping away from phone, TV, computer screens for about 30 to 60 minutes um, before bed. From a nutritional standpoint, if you're someone who is sensitive to caffeine, um, try to avoid consuming it after about 2 p.m. Um, also, uh, try to avoid eating a large meal within two hours of going to bed. Um, and then there are some foods that you can um, eat to help increase your body's natural production of melatonin. Um, and then magnesium too um, would be important uh, just to stimulate that relaxation. Um, so some foods, you know, that help to stimulate that natural production of melatonin. Um, we've got tart cherries, bananas, corn, asparagus, um, tomatoes, uh, pineapple, you know, a bunch of nuts and seeds, uh, walnuts, peanuts, sunflower seeds, um, and then some grains like rice, uh, barley, and rolled oats. So those can help to uh, naturally stimulate that melatonin production. Um, and then again, magnesium, um, just kind of that calming. Um, again, our dark leafy greens, nuts and seeds, uh, wheat germ, fish, soybeans, bananas, avocados, um, and low-fat yogurt. So that's, I feel like that was a lot of information. Um, so that's kind of uh, fueling, you know, throughout the menstrual cycle. Um, if you have any questions, um, you know, feel free. There's my email. Um, follow me on Instagram. I was hoping to have my website up uh, by this time for people to check out, but I'm waiting for my like domain name to transfer and it's a whole kind of complicated process. Uh, but thank you for your attention. Thank you for listening. Um, and then I don't know if we're going to do some hmm. questions if we have time. I realized I spoke a lot longer than half an hour, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Steph. That was like a lot of good information. Um, if you're free to stick around for questions, um, I know some of our coaches had to uh, step off, but if you guys have any questions, you want to pop them in the chat, uh, we can address some of those for a couple minutes before we kind of sign off for the night. Um, I don't know if you're able to... I've moved back inside. The mosquitoes were getting me, unfortunately. <laughs> I was so jealous when I first saw you outside. I was like, oh, that would have been such a great idea. Uh, it was nice until it wasn't anymore. <laughs> okay. So if any of you guys have questions, um, you want to pop, pop them in the chat, that's fine. Uh, you can also, like Steph mentioned, send her an email, or you can shoot any of us coaches an email or uh, reach out on us reach out to us on social media. Uh, Kim and Chantel want me to pass that along as well. You can reach out to them if you want to talk about some of that stuff. Um, and otherwise, thank you all so much for joining us. And I hope you all enjoy the rest of your night. Thanks, Francine. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Lauren. Have a good night, guys. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye.